Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, your word calls for a response of wisdom, for patient endurance and for faithfulness. And Father, we pray as we hear you speak through your word this morning that you would by your spirit stir those things in our hearts and in our lives. We pray it for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, what a year it's been, hey? What a year. I've had um, a number of people just say to me recently, oh, I don't know about the students at college this year, they're, they're going to be a bit undercooked, aren't they? Um, don't you think they're missing out? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but it has been a tough year, hasn't it? It's been a really tough year. And I know for, for some people the year's been much tougher than it has for others. I know there are people here this morning whose lives are full of pain, uh, whose loved ones are sick or dying, um, some here who are suffering financially, some who are suffering with grief, with relationship breakdowns, with profound disappointment, with anxiety, with struggles of many kinds, exhaustion. And I know there are people here who are struggling under the weight of sin as well, sin and temptation Uh, some who've fallen to temptation some who just feel the unbearable weight of their own struggle with sin that just never seems to go away maybe you just feel weary i wonder what is the toughest thing going on for you in life right now what's the toughest thing going on and do you wish that god would just take it away Would you be better off if God would just take that away from you? See, for us, the idea of joy and trial are almost opposites. But friends, I want you to experience pure joy in life and if you're going to do that, you're going to need to see through the lies of the evil one, the lies of the world that get you to pin your hopes here and now and you're going to need to see the radical difference of the wisdom of God when it comes to suffering and trial. And so for the next three weeks we're going to be reading James together. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered amongst the nation. Greetings. Consider it Pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed about by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of firstfruits 
of all he created. And so this morning we're going to look together at the perspective, the response, the passion and the promises of God that fuel perseverance. If we want to get past the pains and hurts that life throws up and still have joy and be strong in the Lord Jesus to the end, we're going to need to take on board the persevering perspective, the persevering response, the persevering purpose, and fourthly, the promises of God. So let's look at those four things together as we work our way through the chapter, although not quite in order. In fact, we'll pick it up from verse 9. The persevering perspective is the one that recognises up front we're all going to face trials of many kinds and Satan would love for us to throw in the towel and not persevere. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls, its beauty is destroyed, in the same way the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. In suffering there are temptations, there are risks for everybody, but the risks are not the same for all of us. The risks for the believer who is in humble circumstances is that they might become depressed by that. When you meet someone for the first time and you introduce yourself and you ask questions of them, and so you bowl up to them and you ask them, what do you do? Where do you live? Tell us about your family. The believer in humble circumstances replies, well, I haven't got a job or I'm in a job I hate and I haven't got anywhere to live right now or I live over there and my family well I haven't spoken to them for ages dysfunctional relationships everywhere you look and even at the moment of introduction we confirm for the believer in humble circumstances you've got nothing how does that person feel about themselves well as I'm talking now you might think well that's me That's how I feel about myself. I look at my own circumstances, I say, you're a loser. What have you got? Nothing to hope for. And the word of God to you this morning is, take pride in your high position. Take pride, it might not look like it to the world, but take pride in your high position. As a Christian, you are a precious child of God, created by him, redeemed by him. In dying for you, Jesus has made you worth dying for. You are an heir of heaven. You are in an exalted position in God's good creation. If you're in humble circumstances, if you feel like that today, that you are worth less, You've got to look past what's obvious and right before your eyes and take the perspective of eternity that you have an exalted position. But what if you're not like that? What if you're the opposite? What if you love people asking you those three questions? What if in all of your answers it confirms for you just how good you are? just how well off you are. If you're used to being looked up to, if you're the happy, wealthy, successful type, the rich man in James' language, if that's you, the Bible's warning to you is that all of these things that make you look good to everybody around you are destined for the scrap heap. All of these things that you and others are putting your hopes into are fading away. Your money, your beauty, your health, your status, your education, all passing away like the flowers of the field. 
the brother in humble circumstances is encouraged to look beyond this life to get a perspective. And the one who is rich is encouraged also to look beyond this life and get a perspective. There are risks in any circumstances that we might become proud or depressed and in both cases the right response is to take on a persevering perspective, an eternal perspective that changes how we look at our circumstances today. And it's fascinating that we all struggle with the problem of pain. Lots of books written about that. But it's a big library. I can tell you there's no book in there about the problem of pleasure. But you think about those people you know who've fallen away from the Christian faith, who've walked away from Jesus. And you tell me, does it happen more often because of pain or because of pleasure? I know a few people who've walked away because of great tragedies and uh, difficulties in their life. But I literally know dozens who've fallen away from the Lord Jesus because they've pursued the good life. Whatever it is that gets in the way of our Christian lives, we ought to pray for deliverance from it, shouldn't we? So I wonder, do you want to join with me in praying that the Lord would deliver you from success, adulation, acceptability, good marks, great wealth, pleasure? Do we have a persevering perspective? Well, apart from that perspective, we also need a response, a right response. What does this perspective give you? It gives you a persevering response. There's basically two options for what you do when the trials or temptations come. Uh, James gives us the two here. The first is you give in. Um, James 1.13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person's tempted when they're dragged away or enticed by their own evil. Sorry, dragged away by their own evil and enticed. Then after desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. When it says there, don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters, there's no greater area for us to be deceived in than our own understanding of ourselves and of God. In that area of knowledge, we can easily be deceived. We underestimate God's goodness and we overestimate our own goodness. I wonder if you heard the story about the little girl whose mother was scolding her for beating up her younger brother. And the mother said, why did you let the devil put it into your heart to kick him in the shins and pull his hair and punch his nose? And the little girl responded, well, it might have been the devil's idea to kick him in the shins, but pulling his hair, punching his nose, that's all me. See, she gets it, doesn't she? She gets it. It's our hearts that is the problem. It's our desires, in verse 14, that drag us away and entice us. Our desires, our thoughts, our hearts that lead us to sin, in verse 15. Faced with temptation, faced with trials, pressured by the world around us, it's very easy to throw up our hairs and say, oh, it's not my fault, it's not me, and to give in, to blame God or to blame someone else. But there is another option. It's the option of persevering. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Or back up in verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I want you to notice here again that there's no option for a pain-free life 
There's, there, there's no option for choosing out of that, for choosing a risk-free life or a temptation-free life. There's no follow these three steps and you'll put it all behind you and enter some kind of you know, bliss. Just have faith, follow your heart, be true to yourself, everything will be wonderful. It, that's just fairy dust or bull dust or whatever. It's not real, is it? What's real? What's real is that we all face trials of many kinds. We don't get to choose that bit, but we do choose how we will respond. And the Bible is urging us to respond by persevering. There's a Buddhist proverb that goes like this. Pain makes you think. Thinking makes you wise. Wisdom makes you makes pain bearable. Why, a cave is not much of a life, is it? What James is saying here is so much better, isn't it? Look at verse 4 again. Consider what God's purpose is in all of this. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's the persevering purpose. Third point, the persevering purpose. This is God's goal and it's so different to my goal. I think most of the time I'd be happy to be just a bit better than I am now. A bit less worldly, a bit more spiritual, a bit less greedy, a bit less selfish, a bit more generous, a bit more loving. Do a bit more praying. Have a bit more Bible reading. Just be a bit more. And I think I could actually pull that off a bit. But look at what God's purpose is in all of this. That you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That is a radical goal. It's a radical proposal and it will take radical measures to bring that about. But this is God's purpose. He says the same thing in different ways at the end, verses 17 and 18. Um, What is God's good and perfect gift to us? I had my birthday recently and you know what it's like, your birthday and you are, you know, the presents come out and you're thinking, okay, socks or what is it? What is the good and perfect gift? Well, what is the good and perfect gift that God would want to give you? It's most often not the one I'd ask for. I would like the gift that makes me comfortable, the gift that brings me pleasure. But God's purpose is that I might have a new birth, that I might be mature and complete, that I might stand the test and receive the crown of life and the good and perfect gift is the thing that brings that about. Now, because I'm so self-centred and short-sighted, most of the time I have a, I have a difficult time even imagining how that's going to happen. But it's God's purpose to bring that about and his good and perfect gift is the thing that he gives me in order to achieve that purpose. And that is why it's possible, not only possible, but wise to consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because they are God's good and perfect gift to bring about your eternal salvation, the crown of life, maturity and completeness. I wonder if that is how you look at that greatest difficulty in your life that I asked you about earlier. Is it God's good and perfect gift for you? Fourthly, lastly this morning... There is a great promise, isn't there? But it's a promise that comes with a warning. What is the persevering promise? From verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. 
Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. The one who asks must believe and not doubt or they'll not receive anything. Does that mean that you've got to put in the mental effort to eliminate all thoughts of doubt from your mind? Well, no, that's not how doubt and faith work in James's letter. When he talks about believing and doubt, he's talking not about an intellectual thing, he's talking about um, what motivates you to action. What's behind your life? Why do you do the things you do? If you live your life both as a believer and an unbeliever, he says that, that's being a double-minded person. That's like a wave that constantly changes shape, verse 6. You're like a lady with one foot on the jetty and one foot on the boat. And you know if you continue to stand like that, it's going to end in disaster. You've got to choose to put both feet in one place. Do you notice there that the person who keeps one foot on both things, in verse 7, is double-minded, unstable in all they do, and verse 7, should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. Now, be clear, it's not saying God won't give you anything unless your faith is 100% perfect. That's a terrible lie. What it's saying is that if when you face trials, when you feel your own shortcomings, your own lack of understanding or lack of wisdom in verse 5, if at that moment you waver and you start to live out the consequences of unbelief, you turn to yourself, to your own resources. Maybe you even start to blame God in verse 13. If that happens, you will not receive anything from the Lord. But be clear, the blockage is not on God's part that he won't give, but on our part. Our failing to trust in God means that we are unable to receive. God is the one who gives generously to all without finding fault, in verse 5. But in our failure to trust, we cut ourselves off from access to his mercy, his grace. And look at what God wants to give us in this passage, not just wisdom, so that we can endure and persevere. He wants to give us new birth through the word of truth in verse 18. He wants to give us the crown of life in verse 12. It's the promise of persevering. How can you consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds? Well, you can look at what God in his, generous, in his generosity is giving us through these things. You can use these things to turn to him. Now, friends, I'm not going to pretend that that's easy to see in the midst of it all. Uh, even as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about the moments where God has really fitted me up for heaven. And I decided I couldn't even tell you about some of those because I'd just burst into tears and be a blubbering mess and I wouldn't get through the end of it. Because they're awful. It's awful. But it's actually for me, I can tell you, in the most awful of times that God has dealt with my pride, with my self-sufficiency, with my besetting sins and caused me to trust in him and him alone to look not to this world but to a world to come. This is how he fits us up and makes us ready for his heaven. So it has been a tough year. And I've got no magic uh, formula for working this out. But it wouldn't surprise me if you are some of the best equipped graduates that Moore College will ever send out because of that. Because you have had to learn to endure through a more difficult time. What a good and perfect gift that has been to fit us up for heaven, to get us to loosen our grip on this world and lift our eyes. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. If you believe that and it's true, 
If you persevere under trial to gain the crown of life, then the trials and temptations that we are facing are cause for great joy because this is how God is bringing us home. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would give us a perspective that sees what you are doing in the world and chooses to persevere. We pray by your Spirit, Father, that you would convince us of your good purposes in all of this and move us to persevere. Father, we thank you for your promises and again we pray by your spirit you'd convict us of the truth of those things and cause us to persevere. That we might persevere to the end, gain the crown and bring glory to the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray it in his name. Amen.